morning everybody afternoon evening whatever it is where you're from we're going to go on to chapter eight now it's, it's plot thickens the story gets deeper remember the, uh, the dwarves bilbo have been left at the entrance to merhood by gandalf after being looked after by Bjorn. Uh, the very serious message, I think, before they entered this very dangerous phase of their journey was don't leave the path. Don't leave the path. Chapter 8 is a long one again, so I'm going to do it in two parts. So chapter 8, Flies and Spiders, part 1. They walked in single file. The entrance to the path was like a sort of arch leading into a gloomy tunnel made by two great trees that lent together too old and strangled with ivy and hung with lichen to bear more than a few blackened leaves. The path itself was narrow and wound in and out among the trunks. Soon the light at the gate was, was like a little bright hole far behind, and the, the quiet was so deep that their feet seemed to thump along while all the trees leaned over them and listened. As their eyes became used to the dimness, they could see a little way to either, either side in a sort of dark and green glimmer. Occasionally, a slender beam of sun that had the look to, had the look to slip in through some opening in the, far, in the leaves far above, and still more luck in not being caught in the tangled boughs and matted twigs beneath, stabbed down thin and bright before them. But this was seldom, and it soon ceased altogether. There were black squiddles in the wood. As Bilbo's sharp, inquisitive eyes got used to seeing things, he could catch glimpses of them whisking up the path and scuttling behind tree trunks. There were queer noises too, grunts, scufflings and hurryings in the undergrowth and among the leaves that lay piled endlessly thick in places on the forest floor. But what made the noise, noises he could not see. The nastiest things they saw were the cobwebs, dark dense cobwebs with threads extraordinarily thick, often stretched from tree to tree or tangled in the lower branches on either side of them. There were none stretched across the path, but whether because some magic kept it clear, or for what other reason, they couldn't guess. It was not long before they grew to hate the forest as heartily as they hated the tunnels of the goblins, and it seemed to offer even less hope of any ending. But they had to go on and on, long after they were sick for the sight of the sun and of the sky, and longed for the feel of wind on their faces. There was no movement of air down under the forest roof, and it was everlastingly still and dark and stuffy. Even the dwarves felt it, who were used to tunneling, and lived at times for long whiles without the light of the sun. But the hobbits, who liked holes to make a house in but not to spend summer days in, felt that he was being slowly suffocated. The nights were the worst. It then became pitch dark. Not what you call pitch dark, but really pitch. So black that you really, really could see nothing. Bilbo tried flapping his hand in front of his nose, but he couldn't see it at all. Well, perhaps it is not true to say that they could see nothing. They could see eyes. They slept all closely huddled together and took it in turns to watch. And when it was Bilbo's turn, he would see gleams in the darkness around them, and sometimes pairs of yellow or red or green eyes would stare at him from a little distance and then slowly fade and disappear and slowly shine out again in another place. And sometimes they would gleam down from the branches just above him. And that was most terrifying. But the eyes that he liked the least were horrible, pale, bulbous sort of eyes. Insect eyes, he thought, not animal eyes, only they were much too big. Although it was not yet very cold, they tried lighting watch fires at night, but they soon gave that up. It seemed to bring hundreds and hundreds of eyes all around them. Though the creatures, whatever they were, were careful never to let their bodies show in the little flicker of the flames. Worse still, it brought thousands of dark grey and black moths, some nearly as big as your hand, flapping and whirring round their ears. They could not stand that, nor the huge bats, black as a top hat either. So they gave up fires and sat at night and dozed in, in the enormous, uncanny darkness. All this went on for what seemed to the hobbits ages upon ages, and he was always hungry, for they were extremely careful with their provisions. Even so, as days followed days, 
and still the forest seemed just the same, they began to get anxious. The food would not last forever. It was, in fact, already beginning to get low. They tried shooting at the squirrels, and they wasted many arrows before they managed to bring one down on the path. But when they looked at it, it pr proved horrible to taste, and they shot no more squirrels. They were thirsty too, but they had not too much water, and in all the time they had seen neither spring nor stream. This was their state when one day they found their path blocked by a running water. It flowed fast and strong, but not very wide right across the way, and it was black, or looked it in the gloom. It was well that Bjorn had warned them against it, or they would have drunk from it, whatever it's called and filled some of their empty skins at its bank. As it was, they only thought of how to cross it without wetting themselves in its water. There had been a bridge of water cross, but it had rotted and fallen, le and fallen, leaving only the broken posts near the bank. Bilbo, kneeling on the brink and peering forward, cried, There is a boat against the far bank. Now why couldn't it have been this side? How far away do you think it is? asked Thor but by now they knew Bilbo had the sharpest eyes among them. Not at all far. I shouldn't think about twelve yards. Twelve yards? I should have thought it was thirty at least, but my eyes don't see as well as they used a hundred years ago. Still, twelve yards is as good as a mile. We can't jump it, and we dare try to wade or swim. Can't any of you throw a rope? What's the good of that? The boat is sure to be tied up. Even if we could hook it, which I doubt. I don't believe it is tied, said Bilbo, though of course I can't be sure in this light, but it looks to me as if it was just drawn up on the bank, which is low, just where the path goes down into the water. Dory is the strongest, but Philly is the youngest, and still has the best sight, said Thor. Come here, Philly, and see if you can see if you can see the boat Mr Baggins is talking about. Philly thought he could, so when he'd stared a long while to get an idea of the direction, the others brought him a rope. They had several with them. And on the end of the longest, they fastened one of the large iron hooks they had used for catching their packs to the straps about their shoulders. Philly took this in his hand, balanced it for a moment, and then flung it across the stream. Splash, it fell in the water. Not far enough, said Bilbo, who was peering forward. A couple of feet, and you would have dropped it on the boat. Try again. I don't suppose the magic is strong enough to hurt you if you just touch a bit of wet rope. Philly picked up the hook when he had drawn it back, rather doubtfully all the same. This time he threw it with great strength. Steady, said Bilbo. You've thrown it right into the wood on the other side now. Draw it back gently. Philly hauled the rope back slowly and after a while Bilbo said, Carefully, it is lying on the boat. Let's hope the hook will catch. It did. The rope went taut. And Philly pulled in vain. Killy came to his help, and then Oin and Gloin, they tugged and tugged, and suddenly they all fell over on their backs. Bilbo was on the lookout, however. Caught the rope, and with a piece of stick, fended off the little black boat as it came rushing across the stream. Help, he shouted, and Balin was just in time to seize the boat before it floated off down the current. It was tied after all, said he, looking at the snapped painter that was still dangling from it. That was a good pull, my lads, and a good job that our rope was the stronger. Who will cross first? said Bilbo. I shall, said Thorin, and you will come with me, and Philly, and Balin. That's as many as the boat will hold at the time. After that, Killy, and Oin, and Gloin, and Dory. Next, Orion, Nori, Biffer, and Buffer. And last, Dwellin, and Bomber. I'm always last, and I don't like it, said Bomber. It's somebody else's turn today. You shouldn't be so fat. As you are, you must be the last and, and the lightest boatload. Don't start grumbling against orders, or something bad will happen to you. There aren't any oars. How are you going to push the boat back to the far bank, asked the hobbit. Give me another length of rope and another hook, said Philip. And when they had got it ready, he cast it into the, into the darkness ahead, and as high as he could throw it. Since it didn't fall down again, they saw that it must have stuck in the branches. Get in now, said Philip. And one of you haul on the rope that is stuck in the tree on the other side. One of the others must keep hold of the hook we used at first. And when we are safe on the other side, he can hook it on and you can draw the boat back. 
In this way, they were all soon on the far bank, safe across the enchanted stream. Dwayne had just scrambled out with the coiled rope on his arm, and Bonbo, still grumbling, was getting ready to follow when something bad did happen. There was a flying sound of hooves on the path ahead. Out of the gloom came suddenly the shape of a flying deer. It charged into the dwarves and bowled them over, then gathered itself for a leap. High it sprang and cleared the water with a mighty jump. But it did not reach the other side in safety. Thorin was the only one who had kept his feet and his wits. As soon as they had landed, he had bent his bow and fitted an arrow in case any hidden guardian of the boat appeared. Now he sent a swift and sure shot into the leaping beast. As it reached the further bank, it stumbled. The shadows swallowed it up, but they heard the sound of hooves quickly falter and then go still. Before they could shout in praise of the shot, however, a dreadful wail from Bilbo put all thoughts of venison out of their minds. Bomber has fallen in! Bomber is drowning! he cried. It was only too true. Bomber had only one foot on the land when the hair, when the heart, bore down on him and sprang over him. He'd stumbled, thrusting the boat back away from the bank and then toppled back into the dark water, his hands slipping off the slimy roots at the edge while the boat spanned slowly off and disappeared. They could still see his hood above the water when they, when they ran to the bank. Quickly they flung the rope with a hook towards him. His hand caught it and they pulled him to the shore. He was drenched from hair to boots, of course, but that was not the worst. When they laid him on the bank, he was already fast asleep, with one hand clutching the rope so tight that they could not get it from his grasp and fast asleep he remained in spite of all they could do. They were still standing over him, cursing their ill luck and Bomber's clumsiness and lamenting the loss of the boat, which made it impossible for them to go back and look for the heart, when they became aware of the dim blowing of horns in the wood and the sound as of dogs baying far off. Then they all fell silent, and as they sat it seemed they, they could hear the noise of a great hunt going by to the north of the path, though they saw no sign of it. There they sat for a long while and didn't dare to make a move. Bomber slept on with a smile on his fat face as if he no longer cared for all the troubles that vexed him. Suddenly on the path ahead appeared some white deer, a hind and fawns, as snowy white as the heart had been. They glimmered in the shadows. Before Thor could cry out, three of the dwarves had leaped to their feet and loosed off arrows from their bows. None seemed to find their mark. The deer turned and vanished in the trees, as silently as they had come, and in vain the dwarves shot their arrows after them. Stop, stop, shouted Thor, but it was too late. The excited dwarves had wasted their last arrows, and now the bows that Bjorn had given them were useless. They were a gloomy party that night, and the gloom gathered still deeper on them in the following days. They had crossed the enchanted stream, but beyond it the path seemed to straggle on just as before, and in the forest they could see no change. Yet, if they had, if they had known more about it and considered the meaning of the hunt and the white deer that had appeared upon their path, they would have known that they were at last drawing towards the eastern edge, and would soon have come, if they could have kept up their courage and their hope, to thinner trees and places where the sunlight came again. But they did not know this, and they were burdened with the heavy body of Bomber, which they had to carry along with them as best they could, taking the wearisome task in turns of four, each while the others shared their packs. If these had not become all too light in the last few days, they would never have managed it, but a slumbering and smiling Bomber was a poor exchange for packs filled with food, however heavy. In a few days, a few days, a time came when there was not, there was practically nothing left to eat or to drink. Nothing wholesome could they see growing in the wood, only funguses and herbs with pale leaves and unpleasant smells. About four days from the enchanted streams, the stream, they came to a part where most of the trees were beeches. They were at first inclined to be cheered by the change, but here there was no undergrowth and the shadow was not so deep. There was a greenish light about them and in places they could see some, some distance to either side of the path, yet the light only showed them endless lines of straight great sunks, like the pillars of some huge twilight hall. There was a breath of air and a, no and a noise of wind, but it had a sad sound. 
A few leaves came rustling down to remind them that outside autumn was coming on. Their feet ruffled among the dead leaves of countless other autumns that drifted over the banks of the path from the deep red carpets of the forest. Still Bombo slept, and they grew very weary. At times they heard disquieting laughter. Sometimes there was singing in the distance too. The laughter was the laughter of fair voices, not of goblins, and the singing was beautiful, but it sounded eerie and strange, and they were not comforted. Rather, they hurried on from those parts with what strength they had left. Two days later, they found their path going downwards, and before long, they were in a valley filled almost entirely with a mighty growth of oaks. Is there no end to this accursed forest, said Thor. Somebody must climb a tree and see if he can if he can get his head above the roof and have a look around. The only way is to choose the tallest tree that overhangs the path. Of course, somebody meant Bilbo. They chose it because to be of any use, the climber must get his head above the topmost leaves and he must be light enough for the highest and slenderest branches to bear it. Poor Mr Baggins had never had much practice in climbing trees, but they hoisted him up onto the lowest branches of an enormous oak that grew right out into the path, and up he had to go as best he could. He pushed his way through the tangled twigs with many a slap in the eye. He was green and grimed from the old bark of the greater boughs. More than once he slipped and caught himself just in time, and at last, after a dreadful struggle in a difficult place, where there seemed to be no convenient branches at all, he got near the top. All the time he was wondering whether there were spiders in the tree and how he was going to get down again, except by falling. In the end, he poked his head above the roof of leaves and then he found spiders all right, but they were only small, small ones of ordinary size and they, they were after the butterflies. Bilbo's eyes were nearly blinded by the light. He could hear the dwarves shouting up at him from far below, but he couldn't answer, only hold on and blink. The sun was shining brilliantly, and it was a long while before he could bear it. When he could, he saw all round him a sea of dark green, ruffled here and there by the breeze, and there were everywhere hundreds of butterflies. I expect they were a kind of purple emperor, a butterfly that loves the tops of oak woods. But these were not purple at all. They were a dark, dark, velvety black without any markings to be seen. He looked at the Black Emperors for a long time and enjoyed the feel of the breeze in his hair and on his face. But at length, the cries of the dwarves, who were now simply stamping with impatience down below, reminded him of his real business. It was no good. Gaze as much as he might, he could see no end to the trees and the leaves in any direction. His heart, that had been lightened by the sight of the sun and the feel of the wind, sank back into his toes. There was no food to go back to down below. Actually, as I have told you, they were not far off the edge of the forest, and if Bilbo had had the sense to see, the tree that he had climbed, though it was tall in itself, was standing near the bottom of a wide valley, so that from its top the trees seemed to swell up all round like the edges of a great bowl, and he could not expect to see how far the forest lasted. Still, he did not see this, and he climbed down full of despair. He got to the bottom again at last, scratched hot, scratched hot and miserable, and he couldn't see anything in the gloom below when he got there. His report soon made the others as miserable as he was. The forest goes on forever and ever and ever in all directions. Whatever shall we do, and what is the use of sending a hobbit, they cried, as if it was his fault. They did not care tuppence about the butterflies, and, and were only made more angry when he told them of the beautiful breeze, which they were too heavy to climb up and feel. That night they ate their very last scraps and crumbs of food, and next morning, when they woke, the first thing they noticed was that, was that they were still gnawingly hungry, hungry, and the next thing was that it was raining, and that here and there the drip of it was dropping heavily on the forest floor. That only reminded them that they were also partingly thirsty, without doing anything to relieve them. You cannot quench a terrible thirst by standing under giant oaks and waiting for a chance drip to fall on your tongue. The only scrap of comfort there was came, un there was, came unexpectedly from Bomber. He woke up suddenly and sat up scratching his head. He could not make out where he was at all, nor why he felt so hungry. 
For he'd forgotten everything that had happened since they started their journey that May morning long ago. The last thing that he remembered was the party at the Hobbit's house, and they had great difficulty in making, making him believe their tale of all the many adventures they, they had had since. When he heard that there was nothing to eat, he sat down and wept, for he felt very weak and wobbly in the legs. Why ever did I wake up, he cried. I was having such beautiful dreams. I dreamed I was walking in a forest rather like this one, only lit with torches on the trees and lamps swinging from the branches and fires burning on the ground. And there was a great feast going on, going on forever. A woodland king was there with a crown of leaves and there was a merry singing and I couldn't count or describe the things that were there to eat and drink. You need, to, need not try, said Thorin. In fact, if you can't talk about something else, you'd better be silent. We're quite annoyed enough without you as it is. If you hadn't waked up, we should have left you to your idiotic dreams in the forest. You were no joke to carry even after weeks of short, short commons. There was nothing now to be done but to tighten the belts around their empty stomachs and hoist their empty sacks and packs and trudge along the track without any great hope of ever getting to the end before they lay down and died of starvation. This they did all that day, going very slowly and wearily, while Bomber kept on wailing that his legs would not carry him and that he wanted to lie down and sleep. No, you don't, they said. Let your legs take their share. We've carried you far enough. All the same, he suddenly refused to go a step further and flung himself on the ground. Go on if you must, he said. I'm just going to lie here and sleep and dream of food if I can't get it any other way. I hope I never wake up again. At that very moment, Balin, who, who was a little way ahead, called out, What was that? I thought I saw a twinkle of light in the forest. They all looked, and the longest way off, it seemed, they saw a red twinkle in the dark. Then another, and another sprang out beside him. Even Bombor got up, and they hurried along them, not caring if it was trolls or goblins. The light was in front of them, and to the left of the path, and when at last they had drawn level with it, it seemed plain that torches and fires were burning under the trees, but a good way off their track. It looks as if my dreams were coming true, gasped Bombo, puffing up behind. He wanted to go straight off into the woods after the lights, but the others remembered only too well the warnings of the wizard and of beyond. A, fight, a feast would be no good if we never got back alive from it, said Thorin. But without a feast, we shan't remain alive much longer anyway, said Bombo and Bilbo heartily agreed with him. They argued about it backwards and forwards for a long while until they agreed at length to send out a couple of spies to creep near the lights and find out more about them. But then they could not agree on who, who was to be sent. No one seemed anxious to run the chance of being lost and never finding his friends again. In the end, in spite of warnings, hunger decided them because Bomber kept on describing all the good things that were being eaten according to his dream in the woodland feast. So they all left the path and plunged into the forest together. After a good deal of creeping and crawling they peered round the trunks and looked into a clearing where some trees had been felled and the ground levelled. There were many people there, elvish looking folk, all dressed in green and brown and sitting on sawn rings in the fell trees of the fell trees in a great circle. There was a fire in their midst and there were torches fastened to some of the trees round about. But most splendid sight of all, they were eating and drink drinking and laughing merrily. The smell of the roast meat was so enchanting that without waiting to consult one another, every one of them got up and scrambled forwards into the ring with the one idea of begging for some food. No sooner had the first stepped into the clearing than all the lights went out as if by magic. Somebody kicked the fire and it went up in rockets of glittering sparks and vanished. They were lost in a completely lightless dark and they could not find, even find one another. Not for a long time at any rate. After blundering frantically in the gloom, falling over logs, logs, bumping, crashing to trees and shouting and calling till they must have waked everything in the forest for miles, at last they managed to gather themselves in a bundle and count themselves by touch. By that time they had, of course, quite forgotten in what direction the path lay, and they were all hopelessly lost, at least till morning. 
There was nothing for it but to settle down for the night where they were. They did, did not even dare to search on the ground for scraps of food for fear of becoming separated again. But they had not been lying long and Bilbo was only just getting drowsy when Dory, whose turn it was to watch first, said in a loud whisper, the lights are coming out again over there and there are more than ever of them. Up they all jumped. There, sure enough, not far away, were scores of twinkling lights. And I heard, and they heard the voices and laughter quite plainly. They crept slowly towards them in a single line, each touching the back of the one in front. When they got near, Thorin said, No rushing forward this time. No one is to stir from hiding till I say. I shall send Mr Baggins alone first to talk to them. They won't be frightened of him. What about me of them? thought Bilbo. And anyway, I hope they won't do anything nasty to him. When they got to the edge of the circle of lights, they pushed Bilbo suddenly from behind. Before he had time to slip on his ring, he stumbled forward into the full blaze of the fire and torture. It was no good. Out went all the lights again, and complete darkness fell. If it had been difficult collecting themselves before, it was far worse this time, and they simply could not find the Hobbit. Every time they counted themselves, it only made thirteen. They shouted and called, Bilbo Baggins, Hobbit! You dratted Hobbit! Hi, Hobbit, come fusticate you, where are you? And other things of that sort. But there was no answer. They were just giving up hope when Dory stumbled across him by sheer luck. In the dark, he fell over what he thought was a log, and he found it was the Hobbit, curled up fast asleep. It took a deal of shaking to wake him, and when he was awake, he was not pleased at all. I was just having a lovely dream, he grumbled. All about having a most glorious dinner. Good heavens. He's gone like Bomber, they said. Don't tell us about dreams. Dream dinners aren't, aren't any good and we can't share them. They're the best I'm likely to get in this beastly place, he muttered, as he lay down beside the dwarfs and tried to go back to sleep and find his dream again. But that was not the last of the lights in the forest. Later, when the night must have been getting old, Keely, who was watching them, came and roused them all again, saying, There's a regular blaze of light begun not far away. Hundreds of torches and many fires must have been lit suddenly and by magic, and half to the singing and the harps. After lying and listening for a while, they found they could not resist the desire to go nearer and try once more to get help. Up they got again, and this time the result was disastrous. The feast that they, that, that they now saw was greater and more magnificent than than before, and at the head of a long line of feasters sat a woodland king with a crown of leaves upon his golden hair, very much as Bomber had described the figure in his dream. The eldest folk were passing bowls from hand to hand and across the fires, and some were harping and many were singing. Their gleaming hair was twined with flowers, green and white gems glinted on their collars and their belts, and their faces and their songs were filled with mirth. Loud and clear and fair were those songs, and out stepped Thorin into their midst. Dead silence fell in the middle of a, of a word. Out went all light. The fires leaped up in black smokes. Ashes and cinders were in the eyes of the dwarves, and the woods were filled again with their clamour and their cries. Bilbo found himself running, running round and round, as he thought, and calling and calling. Dory, Nori, Ori, Orin, Gloin, Philly, Killy, Bomber, Biffer, Boffer, Dwayland, Balin, Thor and Oakenshield. While people he could not see or feel were doing the same all round him, with an occasional Bilbo thrown in. But the cries of the others got steadily further and fainter, and though after a while it seemed to him they changed to yells and cries for help in the far distance, all noise at last died right away, and he was left alone in complete Silence and darkness. End of chapter 8, part 1.